Hi guys and welcome to my spoiler review of the novel Tuha by Meat Bun Doesn't Eat Meat. I am fucking ready to talk about this novel. So in this review I'm gonna have different sections. I'm gonna have a section where I break down the story and like all the major plot developments, sort of like a recap. I'm gonna talk about the cons, I'm gonna talk about the pros, I'm gonna talk about my favourite characters, my favourite plot twists, my favourite scenes and then a conclusion to wrap it off. Let's go! The book opens with Moran, who is the tyrannical empire of the entire mortal world. His palace is currently being sieged and his reign will soon come to an end. Moran had already taken poison before these cultivators could barge in and capture him. After a talk with his cousin, Shumeng, Moran stumbles out of the palace and falls into a grave that he had already dug. Moran awakes the year he became a disciple of a Shisheng peak, five years before he became the evil emperor. We find out Moran took this evil path after his love Shimei died during a battle where a heavenly rift opened. Moran decides to try and save Shimei in this life, thus he wouldn't walk the same path that he once did. We meet his Shizon Chuaning who is cold and aloof. In the past life, Chuaning was actually someone that Moran abused and kept as a consort. Now, Chuaning is a Shisheng Peak Shizon, which means master, sort of like teacher. Under him, we have Moran Shimei and Moran's cousin Shumei. Xu Meng is the son of the Shisheng Peak sect leader Xu Zhengyong, which means that Moran is the nephew of the Shisheng Peak leader. We've witnessed the four of them solve a mission in Butterfly Town and then go to Jincheng Lake to get their spiritual weapons. However, at Jincheng Lake, Moran realises that there is someone who can use the forbidden techniques and long chest formation which Moran had formerly mastered in his past life. After this arc, we realise that Chuaning likes Moran, but he is too ashamed and has too low self-esteem to act on his feelings. But because of his experience in the past, Moran hates Chuaning. However, around this time, Moran is hit with the realisation. Why did he become such a tyrannical leader in the past? Why did he react in the way that he did? Moran and Chuaning are then recruited to train at Peach Blossom Springs, where Moran is then accused of murdering the sect leader, 18. After escaping the sect, Chuaning and Moran then go on a little adventure to try and see if they can find the culprit of the murder. The heavenly rift that killed Shimei actually comes years earlier than Moran anticipated, and instead of Shimei dying, Chuaning dies after he uses his own life to save Moran's. Because of this, Moran then realises that Chuaning had actually been protecting him all this time. Chuaning's old master, Chuaning's old master, Chuaning's old master, Chuaning's old master turns up and tasks Moran with the mission to go to the afterlife to retrieve Chuaning's soul. Moran manages to retrieve Chuaning's soul. However, Chuaning will be in a coma for five years while his old master works hard to revive him. So Moran goes traveling, Shumeng trains himself up and Shimei studies medicine. Five years pass. Moran comes back, buff as fuck, and Chuaning is like, damn, I got more boners than I did before. Moran promises to stay with Chuaning wherever he goes. Chuaning begins to experience memories from his past life, which he believes is just him being corny as fuck. Then Chuaning and Moran are tasked with helping a village do their farming. The novel then goes a bit like Silver Spoon, Harvest Moon for a bit, but don't let that distract you, a big storm be coming. So many boners later. Moran has the revelation that the person he likes isn't Shimei, the person he loves is Chuaning. The two return to Shisheng Peak after this farming mission. A letter arrives from Rufeng Sect. There's a wedding. Moran, Chuaning, Xu Meng, and Xu Meng's parents, Madame Wang and Xu Zheng Yong, who is an absolute lad, fucking love him, go to Rufeng Sect for the wedding. So many boners. You thought this all sounded pretty chill, but what the fuck? Shit is kicking off. Turns out the person responsible for the opening of the Heavenly Rift was the Rufeng Sect leader's younger brother. This dude disappears with the help of someone who can use another forbidden technique called the time this dude disappears with the help of someone who can use the other forbidden technique the life and death gate of time and space now a lot is going on but don't let that distract you from the romance Chuaning and moran become a couple so many boners with an extra dose of dry humping moran is actually too afraid to fuck Chuaning because his dick is just that big I'm not even making that up. The sects then turn their attention to get this younger brother of the Rufeng sect, which leads them to Mount Zhao. Oh shit, the younger brother is actually the pawn of a medicine cultivator called Huabinan who wears a veil. The time and space gate opens, but this time another world is linked. These sects get out of there faster than Moran gets a boner. But wait, there's more. Moran isn't actually the Shisheng Peak's younger nephew, he's actually a descendant of the Rufeng sect. What? But wait, 
there's more. The person who came from the link to the other world is Moan from the past. Tai Shan Jun. Chuaning's master, who seems to have known what was going to happen, comes to Mount Jiao to save Chuaning from Tai Shan Jun, and he tells Moran to come and meet him somewhere else. Moran goes to meet Chuaning and Chuaning's master, but Chuaning's master is dead, and Chuaning is a piece of wood. This master left a memory scroll revealing Chuaning's past and his secrets. But more importantly, who told this master what would happen? Chuaning from the past life before he died. This past Chuaning left a sensor in a cave. Doesn't sound sus at all. Moran and Chuaning pass out in the cave. They relive their past. Moran wakes up before Chuaning. Who's that by the sensor? It's past Shime who was thought to have died and caused this whole fucking debacle of Moran taking this dark path. But what the fuck? He's alive. Well, hold the fuck up, bitches, because not only is this Shime, this is actually Huabinan, the mastermind behind everything. Shime had planted an evil flower within Moran in the first year he became a disciple of Shisheng Peak, which exasperated Moran's hatred and led him to become a tyrannous emperor. But this censor that past Chuaning left took out that flower. Shime flees with an unconscious Chuaning and leaves Moran, who, for this time being, cannot use his spiritual power. Moran returns to his sect, where he is then accused of being the mastermind behind the Zhenlong chess formation, where us readers are like, bitch, that wasn't him. Then this last from the Chanyin Pavilion, which is a justice sect, turns up and is like, Moran is actually a murderer. And we're like, bitch, that was a past life, leave Moran alone. To which this last, Mu Yan Li, is like, Moran killed the actual Shisheng Peak's nephew. To which we're like, shit. An attack by the Zhenlong chess pieces then further cements into people's brains that Moran is the one behind these attacks. But hold on, you horny bastards, because this obviously isn't as simple as that. Mu Yan Li is actually on Hua Binan's side. The corpse of Tai Shan Jun, who has some of Tai Shan Jun's consciousness, just to reiterate, Tai Shan Jun is the past Moran, is actually under Hua Binan's control. Hua Binan needs present Moran's spiritual core to make Tai Shan Jun a more powerful pawn for him to fulfill his plans. To get Moran's spiritual core, Hua Binan and Mu Yan Li form up a plan that Moran will be punished at the Chenyin Pavilion where his punishment will be to have his spiritual core removed. But back on Mount Zhao, who wakes up? Chu Aning. Who helps him get out of Mount Zhao? The present Shime, who now disassociates himself from Hua Binan after seeing how many people Hua Binan has killed to fulfill their goal. During Chu Aning's coma, he actually experienced some of Moran's past memories. This is because part of his soul was in Moran. There's a lot going on in this novel, like, just read the novel, like, there's so much I am having to gloss over, like, there's a fucking lot. Experiencing Moran's past memories, Chuaning realises that it was he who Shimei was trying to infect with the flower. However, Moran caught Shimei and convinced Shimei to give him the flower instead. Shimei used a technique to make Moran forget about this memory. Chuaning rushes over to Chinyin Pavilion to save a bloodied and mutilated Moran and flees with him. The two are now wanted people of the cultivation world. Chuaning flees with Moran to a hut he and his master used in the past, and then Moran dies. With present Moran's spiritual core, Taishan Jun is now more powerful. Fast forward, Taishan Jun opens up a gate between the two worlds. What was Hua Binan's plan all along? Well, He's part of a demon race that is discriminated against in the mortal world and he needed someone strong enough to build a bridge for him and his people for them to cross into the demon realm. He has Moran build the bridge and utilize the Zhenlong chess formation. Now, why was the Zhenlong chess formation used? To build this bridge, people need to sacrifice their lives and the best way to do that is via the Zhenlong chess formation because if they just insert this chess piece into people, they can make them do what they want. So these people will willingly sacrifice their lives to become a part of the bridge. Moran is close to finishing this bridge. However, he is stopped by Chuaning, Shu Meng, and two guys with the same name, Mei Han Shu. But this ain't enough. Until the past life Shu Meng and Mei Han Shu's turn up, with only a few more lives to go, Mu Yan Li sacrifices her life towards the bridge. And because she's a descendant of a god, the bridge is now complete. Hua Binan crosses the bridge while everyone fights, but he's turned away as he and Mu Yan Li are half brother and sister, meaning he is not only a descendant of the demon race, but he is a descendant of the god race, which are forbidden in the demon realm. Hua Binan holds the gates open for his people, allowing them to cross before he himself is crushed to death by the gates. The bridge collapses, but Hua Binan's people are now safe. But this ain't over yet, we got more heartbreak to come. Because Hua Binan died, that means Tai Shan Jun, who is now his pawn, dies as well. It's revealed that present Moran's soul entered Tai Shan Jun during the implanting of his spiritual core. Tai Shan Jun turns to Ash as he sends Chuaning through the life and death gate back to his own world, telling Chuaning that the present Moran's soul lives within him 
and the present Moran promising to meet Chuaning again. The depression is strong. After President Moran had died, Chuaning had kept Moran's corpse fresh at the hut in which they retreated to. Chuaning realizes that perhaps Moran can come back in that body. In the afterlife, Moran wakes up. He's actually a demon descendant of the same race to Hua Binan. The demon lord offers Moran eternity, but Moran is like, nah, I'd rather have a few more decades with Chuaning. Moran's soul inhabits the present Moran's body preserved within the hut. Chuaning comes back to the hut. He and Moran reunite. The last chapter is so sweet, like, just read it, man. Basically, Moran and Chuaning stayed at this hut, not wanting to burden Xu Meng, who is now the leader of Shisheng Peak, with their Shizun disciple relationship. They make sure to visit Xu Meng once a year. Time jump. Xu Meng is old now and still the leader of Shisheng Peak. We then see the bigger message of the novel, which is that instead of holding on to the past, we should look to the present and move forward. We can't change the past, so instead, let's focus on what's happening now. That, my friends, is a summary of everything that happens in this novel. It's a lot, and there's a lot that I've glossed over. So, I'm gonna go over my cons and pros again, and this time I'm gonna say spoilers. So, obviously, I mean, spoiler warning, I, I don't really need to say that though, but spoiler warning for the whole novel. I'm gonna start off with my cons. So, I spoke about the uncomfortable scenes before in my spoiler-free review, so all I'll add is just, for me, I love domination. If I have a kink, that's it. I mean, it's not even if I have a kink, I, I have a kink and it's domination. But there's a difference between domination and rape. As said, I don't have a problem with the latter if it progresses the story, but I just feel like some of the detail in those scenes within this novel was just way more than it needed to be. The scene where Moran fucked Chuaning with a candlestick is a kink I don't want to know. I hope that the reason for these scenes wasn't to be sexy, but to highlight Moran's problematic behaviour. But I think as a fandom, we need to be ready to receive criticism for these scenes if the novel blows up after the drama. I completely understand why people wouldn't be on board with these scenes in such detail. I can actually talk about spoilers now, so I'm going to talk about some more criticisms that I couldn't mention before. I'm unsure how to feel about Chu and Ink having romantic feelings for the underage Moran. I don't think we're actually told at what point Chuaning fell for Moran, but it was definitely while he was still under the age of 16. I've noticed that a lot of Chinese danme seem to like the student-teacher relationship. To me, even if someone's 19, if you're their teacher, it's just very unprofessional to have romantic feelings for them. However, I've noticed that a lot of these novels start out where one of the main couple is a student and then the novel will time jump to when they're both adults. So I don't think this is a case of Meatbun romanticizing underage relationships. I think, I think this is more about the concept of waiting for love. I think, which it seems like China likes the concept of waiting for love quite a lot. They seem to like the idea of yearning for someone, but they don't want the characters to be too old as the audience for these novels would be young adults. So. You know, you could even look at something like Heaven Official's Blessing, even though, you know, it's like Xilin and Hua Chung, like all of them, they would be over 800 years old, but their bodies are that of 17 year old. It's like they want to present them as younger people, but they really want that yearning. Does that make sense? Damn. When did this become an analysis of Chinese concepts surrounding love? Okay, enough about the smut. The only bit I feel was underdeveloped was so. Is Luo Fengkui Luo Xinxin's brother? He must have been. They're the only two characters with the last name Luo. But then if they were, what was the point of that reveal? What was the point of that plot point? Because it didn't give anything. It was just there. My next critique is that I wish when Moran died, Chuaning reacted in a different way. I know Meatbun probably wanted to mirror that scene with Tash and Jun's denial of Chuaning's death in the past life. However, I think it would have been a good opportunity to have shown the other side of grief. I just imagine Chuaning would have become numb. Which he did anyway, he did become numb. Which made me feel even more that his initial denial of Moran's death didn't really make sense. My idea of Chuaning would have been that he would have become more reserved and distanced, whereas instead he was just convincing himself that Moran wasn't dead. The fact that he did become more reserved and distanced, I mean, I guess it can console that I wasn't too far off his character trait. But yeah, don't get me wrong, still hit me like a ton of bricks. Okay, I don't think this one is an unpopular opinion. It could be, but I don't think it is. Moran being a descendant of a demon came a bit left field. I feel like it needed more development. 
This is the twist I was talking about in my spoiler free review. I feel like it needed more foreshadowing. If I reread the novel, I'm sure there'll be a moment where I'm like, ah, oh, this is because he's a demon. But the minute, there's no questions that were answered by the fact that he's a demon. I feel like it should have been heavily hinted at when Moran went to the afterlife to retrieve Chuaning's soul. There should have been some indication then that Moran didn't belong there, because when he died, he went to the demon afterlife, right? So he wouldn't have gone to that afterlife. Do demons go to the mortal afterlife? I, I don't fucking know. I just don't know, lads. Beyond me. But yeah, if there's anything that is explained by this twist, then let me know in the comments, because maybe there's a burning question that's only answered with that reveal. I can't think of anything where I'm like, this only makes sense because he is part demon, like, Seeing Moran as he questions his previous actions and motivations really drove this novel and made you realise that there was something much deeper going on. I loved that first chapter where we see Moran question why he hated Chuaning so much. Seeing his character struggle to let go of his past and see himself as someone who can be redeemed draws on to one of the main messages of this novel. We had the first message that became clear take the form of don't hold on to hate, further represented by the evil flower within Moran. As if to say, when you hold on to hate, you plant the seeds to grow the flower. The second message that hit home for me in the last chapter was, don't hold on to the past, you can't change it. Focus on the now and move forward. The third message for me, which relates to the second, but as I wrote this review, I felt like it was its own, is, those who we love, dead or alive, with us or not, will always be in our hearts. They'll always be with us. Oh my God. I mentioned character motivations before. There's no character I can think of that doesn't have a clear motivation for why they do the things that they do. The motivation for Hua Binan was so clear and understandable that you do end up feeling for him and his people. Moran had a clear path of where his hate came from. Chuaning had a clear background reason as to why he reacted the way he did to things. The pacing of this novel is so well delivered that it never feels like you are filler. If anything, I'd have loved to have known more about what Moran got up to during those five years that he travelled. Everything is concise, and I feel like for a novel that's 311 chapters, that's a great achievement. We get to see so much of the world without losing focus on the main plot. I said this before, but we do get a good balance of smart. I've never read anything with this many boners. And I read a lot of hentai. The amount of times we got a description about either chewing or Moran's dick being hard. It, it was giving me stress at one point because I was just like, my god dudes just fucking masturbate. Does masturbating not exist? And then when, when chewing did masturbate for the first time and he felt completely disgusted with himself, like, bitch. Those scenes in the first half where Chuaning was just so against the idea of masturbating, I felt like his sex ed teacher, like trying to tell him why masturbating was a good thing. Speaking of masturbation, there's many scenes to give you a good one. Plot holes. I've written these down just so I make sure that I've got them right. So, chapter 74, Moran and Shime are being held prisoner after 18 dies, and Moran goes to get him food after he noticed Shime is weak. It says, she may be longs to the healing division and shouldn't be here in the attack division area without a token, but anxiety had been high ever since the incident with 18. So the feathered tribe lifted the restriction to easings. Surely it should be the opposite. Like if they were that scared of murder, then surely they should have basically like locked it down so that no one could get anywhere they shouldn't be. Like that bit just seemed a bit like convenient for me. So the point of Peach Blossom Springs taking on disciples was because they had to train people for a war that was coming. But after 18 dies, it, it's just not mentioned again. No one's like, yo, do we still need to train for this war? Like, everyone just kind of moves on. <laughs> like, no one really talks about it again until it's like fucking here. Though it is mentioned, but there's just no urgency about it. There's no one like, yo, this must have been a big war. Like, okay. Moran once mentioned, I can't remember which chapter, that they can send messages to each other through their minds. There were a lot of times where that could have come in handy. For example, you know, like that arc at the village where it was Shime, Chuaning, and Moran. Basically, Shime was like, oh, I'll pop off and tell Shu Zheng Yong what's happened. He could, he could have just beeped him, a, beeped him a little message through his mind. I don't know, just me who didn't really get that. Okay, chapter 251. Chuaning doesn't want Moran to use the life and death gate because of the repercussions it can have on basically reality. But then he uses it himself and with ease. Like he just fucking plays his little Guchin and boom, it's opened. Like, 
Bitch, what? I'm guessing, well, I know that the reason why it's going to be like, oh, he opened it with such ease is because he's Emperor's Wood. But even then, like, he was there saying like, oh, you shouldn't use it, it's dangerous. Just fucking used it himself, didn't he? Chapter 299. Shime is sheltering from the rain in a flashback, and this is a moment where he realises he wants to be Chuanning's disciple. So, Chuanning comes over to him with the oil paper umbrella in hand. Is that not the umbrella Moran gave him? That wouldn't make sense time-wise, so unless it's just a different umbrella, but then I don't know why it was the oil paper umbrella. So I'm guessing that was just a mistranslation. But yeah, it just raised a question for me because I'm like, if that was not a mistake, there's obviously a continuity error there. These plot holes, they aren't significant enough to change or alter the plot. They're just questions I had when reading the novel that I couldn't come up with an answer on my own. Are there any others that I've missed? Let me know. Because, I, I don't know, it's been a while since I read this now. And I'm filming this like a month after I finished it, so. Of all the characters, I think my favourite is Xu Zhengyong. I love this dude. He's like the father we wish we all had. Even when learning that Moran wasn't his nephew, he listened to Moran's story. He was always there to have Moran's back and he spoke out against injustice. Like, he was just the embodiment of a good dude. When he fucking died, I was triggered. I was just like, what the fuck? What the fuck, Meebum? I'm going to say Moran is a favourite too. I had my reservations about him, but the character development was just so well done, he absolutely broke me. Meat Bun managed to craft a character that was so immoral and humanise him. She managed to exemplify that people can be given second chances, and what matters is why they did the things they did. No character or person is born already evil, something leads them to that. Meat Bun allowed us to witness his growth and to see Moran realise who he cares about. I think next I would put Yeowang Shi. I really loved that scene where Yeowang Shi held the umbrella for Moran after he was shackled to the platform during the Chinyin arc. I, I know I'm butchering these names and I'm really sorry. And then that scene where the protesters turn up to go against the Chinyin pavilion after what they did to Shisheng Peak and then Yeowang Shi just turns up and she, oh, she's such a fucking boss. She's such a fucking boss. Even she had really great character growth like Oh, and that last scene with the dude, like, oh my god, it was, oh, it was so beautifully done. When she like hands that kid her handkerchief and she like, she can imagine Nangong Shi beside her and she's like, I don't need that handkerchief because you'll always be with me anyway. And it's, mm, my heart. I'm trying to think whether Chuaning is one of my favourites, but the reason why he isn't in the top of my list is because I feel like his character didn't have as much progression as the other characters. He did convey a lot of emotion though, and he was the one who, towards the latter half of the novel, is the one who progressed the story along. I really do relate to him as well over his low self-esteem. I kind of wish that was explored more and we could have seen him overcome it. I cried at chapter 179 where he asked Moran why he liked him, cause boy, I relate. I do really like his character but I wouldn't say he's in like my top three. Do I have any least favorite characters? I don't think I have any characters that I dislike to a hatred extent. Actually, an obvious person who I would dislike is Huang Xiaoyu, but he was written to be dislikable, so does he really count? Moran and Shai Sini, who is Chuaning in kid form after being affected by the Jiqing Link Vine, are recruited to join Peach Blossom Springs to train. After Peach Blossom Springs is like, yo, we need people because there's going to be a war and we need to train them. Moran and Shai Sini go through a trial where they realise something is going on and it ain't good. They come out of this trial and Moran is accused of murdering the clan leader 18. After an investigation, it turns out the Peach Blossom Springs clan have all been massacred. I did not expect that. That twist blew my fucking mind. <laughs> it never even crossed my mind that this could be a repeat of Jicheng Lake and when Moran and Chuaning jumped down into the abyss and they found the bodies, I was just like... <laughs> I literally messaged my mate who doesn't read Dame novels but she's really interested in the immortality adaption and I was just like, mate, I can't tell you what happens but fuck. <laughs> I did not expect that. I feel like this was the moment where I realised the scale of the plot twists this novel will have. Nangong Chanying predicted that at some point someone could try and manipulate his court. This dude was just like so fucking on it. 
Like, he would have been such an interesting character to have read about. Like, he was such a fucking master and, like, so perceptive. Like, holy shit. I respect this dude and we only had, like, what, three chapters with him? Moran dies. Let me explain this one, right? That whole chapter, I was like, why are they talking like Moran's gonna die? He ain't gonna die. And then he died. I'll always remember this scene because it impacted me so much. I was bawling my eyes out and I got, uh sort of reaction clips i think it's reaction clips because it's not as i'm reading it was after i finished it and i i literally was crying for like 30 minutes i previously cried at chapter 179 thinking that was the chapter that will make you cry as well as the chapter where chiwon ing died oh no bitch no no i heavily underestimated how far meepun would go chapter 279 was written so beautifully which is all the more reason why it impacted me so much let me read a quick quote um <clears throat> So this was, I, I remember when I read this and I was like, hold the fuck up, what? <laughs> Suddenly a branch of a plum tree outside the window was covered with snow. The snow was too heavy and the branch broke, creating a sudden disturbance. The snowball and the tree branches fell together, creating a crisp crackling sound. After the commotion, Chuaning could no longer hear the sound of heartbeats. After I read this, I had to go into work the next day and I was explaining to my co-worker that I was so tired because I was up till midnight crying over a fucking boy love novel. Moran and Chuan Ying get married in Butterfly Town. It was really humorous seeing Moran absolutely lose his mind marrying Chuan Ying when he thought he was marrying Shimei. But within this arc, we see the two kiss for the first time and we see Chuaning protect Moran, which leads us to start questioning what we've learned about Chuaning so far. The travelling of Moran when Chuaning was in the coma after dying. I really like exploring the world within novels, and this arc allowed us to see more of what we've previously been shown. Seeing how Moran became a noble image, and how he grew all this time on his own, was one of the most fulfilling things of this character's journey. I'd have loved to have seen more about his travels and the people he met, to be honest. Relating to this, one of my other favourite moments was how Moran was writing Chuaning a letter every single day for these five years. It was just so sweet. <laughs> Moran and Chuaning meet after the five years apart. This point really made it hit home how much Moran has changed during these five years. The two are now adults and the romance can begin. When Moran and Chuaning had their first kiss after the play at Yuling Village, I probably butchered that name and I am sorry. They kissed up against the tree and then they went to an inn. I love smart, what can I say? So another one of my favourite moments is when Chuaning and Moran escape from Chunin Pavilion and then Shime helps them escape. <sighs> When it said, like, someone walking with a cane, for some reason I fought an old dude, and then I realised it was Shime, and then Shime bed them, like, farewell, and I was like... My heart! Moran's death. The writing was just beautiful. I won't go too much into this one, because I've already explained most of it, but my god, one of the most beautifully haunting deaths I've ever read. After people start protesting outside Chunyin Pavilion because they believe that Shisheng Peak was wronged after the fake testimonies, and then Ye Wang Shi turns up on Nabao Jin, and she's like, yeah bitches, I'm on Moran's side. And then the Shisheng Peak elders and disciples turn up when Chunyin Pavilion start attacking the protesters, and they're just like, yeah, we're here bitches. <laughs> There's so many scenes I loved in the last chapter, like Ye Wang Shi seeing Nan Gong Shi walk beside her, Shimei becoming a roaming doctor, but my favourite has to be Xu Meng is to become the new head of Shisheng Peak. He's confident that Moran didn't die and that Chu Ning is living somewhere with Moran. After Xu Meng's banquet to celebrate him becoming the new head of Shisheng Peak, he sits in his room sad that there was no mention of Moran or Chu Ning turning up, but then he hears a sigh outside his bedroom window. I'm getting teary just thinking about this, what the fuck? He rushes over to the window and sees that someone has left a refurbished sword for him. He runs out the window knowing that this is a gift from Chuaning and Moran, and in the distance he sees them both. Chuaning plays a song and then he and Moran disappear on Chuaning's dragon's back. Dude, that scene. Xu Meng learning that the two are living well together and that they remember him is just so... Oh, oh my god, that scene man. Oh, this novel has fucking broken me, dude, I swear to God. Read this novel if you haven't already. It's a goddamn ride. I've never cried so hard at a novel before. The pros for this novel outweigh the cons by a massive amount. It was really hard to find enough cons to balance out the pros, 
There's so much praise for this novel that I could give to Meatbun. I love that everything in this novel is rounded off and we aren't left with any unanswered questions that make the plot feel incomplete. This is a complete story. We witness one of the best main character developments that I've ever read and the blossoming of beautiful messages that stay with us well after the end. Thanks for watching guys and I'll see you when the drama airs. That kind of sounds like I'll do a react. I won't react to it but I may review it and you know you can guarantee I'm going to be releasing some FMVs if it's good. Like, if it's completely disappointment, I'm just never going to talk about it again. And I'll just act like it doesn't exist. See ya!